Good afternoon. Uh, now I'd like to start the second breakout panel, Entrepreneurship in Japan. Where does growth come from? The panelists for this session is Dr. Robert Eberhard, Assistant Professor of Management and Entrepreneurship at Santa Clara University. Ms. Fujiyo Ishiguro, President and CEO, Netier Group Corporation. Mr. Shinichi Takamiya, Partner and Chief Strategy Office, Globus Capital Partners. As a special contributor, we have Dr. Vachala Panchet, Chairman, Emeritus Pacific Basin Economic Council. The moderator for this session is Mr. George DeVore, Managing Partner, McKinsey Japan. Uh, Mr. Alan Miner, who is listed in this program, is unable to participate due to family, family emergency and uh, being replaced by uh, Mr. Takamiya. Mr. DeVore, please. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to everyone for joining us um, this afternoon for this session, uh, which I hope will be both uh, practical, provocative, and inspiring. Uh, and I think as we were preparing, I think uh, uh, we could see how we could get into heated debates, so I think it will continue. Um, so I am George Devo, I'm the managing partner of McKinsey in Japan. I will moderate this session. As uh, everyone knows, consultants may not be the most entrepreneurial people, so I don't know why I'm qualified, but uh, at least I will try. Um, uh, so with me on the stage uh, are our, our uh, three panelists and special contributor. Um, what we've tried to do is to combine um, the practical entrepreneurship, as you will see, uh, and uh, with uh, proven success in Japan, and also an ability to, for us to step back and think about the overall conditions uh, for success in Japan. And so Robert uh, Eberhardt, <coughs> uh, who is not only a I've, is a not only a an academic who has done a lot of research on entrepreneurship, but also has practiced uh, in Japan as an as an entrepreneur. Um, Ishiguro-san uh, can will be able to uh, uh, test, uh, give testimony about her experience of being. Uh, successful in both the U.S. and in Japan, and compare that. Um, Takamiya-san uh, will be able to give us a viewpoint about how it is to support and nurture uh, and uh, ent uh, entrepreneurs in Japan, and how the situation may be changing, and maybe actually uh, actually be even more uh, exciting going forward. And um, uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Chara Panchet will, uh, I think, will bring not only his experience as uh, the, uh, the chairman of the uh, Pacific Basin Economic Council, but also his experience as helping the Thai economy uh, in his different um, uh, government position and his own personal experience as chairman uh, of the uh, of his conglomerate, diversified conglomerate. So you can see that there is a real interesting mix of people who are both practitioners and uh, uh, observers of, um, of the uh, session. So the objective today is to discuss how Japan can unleash entrepreneurship and innovation uh, in order to promote growth and to explore really what are practical actions, what is the real context, how successful it is today, uh, and to draw the lessons from our panelists. And to start this, I would like to frame a little bit of discussion with a, 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 a two words. This is that uh, I think entrepreneurship in Japan is both an imperative um, and an immense opportunity. Uh, and it's an imperative because if you actually look at the uh, Japanese economy, uh, the big issue of the Japanese economy is the productivity gap uh, between uh, Japan and the rest of the advanced economies. Uh, this is a, a long-term view of the productivity uh, uh, of the m most important advanced economies. What's striking about it is, you know, we know in Japan that demographics means that the answer to, to growth and success is going to come from productivity. And the last few years has seen Japan being, uh, being actually losing ground on that. And in fact, if you compare to the 2000 uh, period. In the 2000 period, people would argue that you had a Japan of export-oriented economies, where we were very productive, and a Japan of domestic economies that were not so productive, but who cared? Now, actually, when you actually look at the situation today, every industry 
is actually has lost competitiveness. So I think this notion of how do you innovate, how do you unleash growth, and what the role of entrepreneurship is massively important. And this comes at a time of uh, a lot of opportunities. As we know, there's massive, uh, massive uh, trends affecting the whole world, trends on which I think Japan is very well positioned to exploit, uh, whether it's um, you know, the position with emerging markets, whether it's uh, you know, energy efficiency and other resource scarcity, the digitalization, aging, of course, uh, and the potential for the government to help. And therefore, I think the question for, at least for me, for Japan is, how do you actually unleash this? And one of the uh, elements of which I think is an, is an obvious one is around technology. Um, this is just a, a view of a recent report we did with the McKinsey Global Institute, where we looked at 12, well, we chose, you know, and you know, everybody has his choice, 12 disruptive technologies that we think will transform the world in the next, um, in the next uh, uh, 20, 20 years. Uh, and it goes from, of course, mobile internet, but also uh, uh, the life science, or 3D printing, or advanced material. These will make massive economic potential. And I would argue that in number of these technologies, Japan has an incredible strength. So how do we unleash this and help entrepreneurship in Japan, whether it's big or small, to take advantage of this? And on this, I will turn to uh, Robert to give us a view on how, uh, what is redriving entrepreneurship based in the US examples. Uh, well, uh, hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Globus and all the organizers of this conference for inviting me here. It's a great honor to be here, uh, I've particularly become my first been impressed with uh, Mr. DeVoe and his, uh, and I've known uh, my friend uh, Shigro for a number of years. We've served on government councils together, and it's great to meet uh, the other two members. So I'm uh, the least qualified person to be here, but I'll certainly do my very best. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we have been doing. Uh, Stanford, at Stanford University, we developed a program called the Study of Japanese Entrepreneurship. And it wasn't really just to study Japan, it was to compare the United States and Japan and see if we can divine truths about entrepreneurship and what it means between the two. We've done this for about eight years now, we're going on our ninth year. Over 100 papers have come out of it, and some of them have been published in the most prestigious journals about entrepreneurship. The reason we did that was that I was an entrepreneur here. My office was one block from here, interestingly enough. Um, we were successful. We had four rounds of venture capital. We sold it in an M&A transaction. Uh, and when I got back to Japan, everybody said, well, there's no entrepreneurship in Japan. And then they say, well, there's no, and there's no VCs, and I just finished four rounds. Or it's impossible to do an M&A in Japan. I'd just done one. You know, so I said, okay, let's, let's study this subject and see what's what. Um, so that's why we're doing it. We're studying these similarities. What I'm going to talk today is really briefly about some of the interesting new things we've discovered that probably challenge common knowledge about it. Certainly, there is less academic work and a lot more press work about entrepreneurship before we start. We hope we're going to clear this up and make it clear er how policies can be devised. First, we know very much, and there's a great deal of that, entrepreneurship and why people do it is not for economic reasons. They don't do it because it's cheap. They don't do it because they're going to make a lot of money. They do it because their friends convince them to do it. They do it because their teachers exhort them to do it. They do it because they feel peer pressure to do it. This is why people become entrepreneurs. We know from tons of data in the United States and Japan that the reason people actually start companies is a social network idea. And basically, otherwise, no one do it. It's a bad bet. If you start a company, you're going to fail. I mean, here, you, I want to be real clear on this. If you start a company, you're almost certainly going to fail. Very few people make it big. Um, it's important to understand this. You're going to design policies. You're going to encourage people to do it, social things that are going to convince them. Uh, not just making it easy to do. Second thing we've learned, and we think this is very important, is educating entrepreneurs. It's really important. A neat study was done showing that the way successful entrepreneurs start their companies and organize their activities is completely different than the way it's taught in MBA schools. Um, and that's been replicated a number of times. 
Um, what's interesting about it, we find that the education in entrepreneurs is experienced in the industry they're entering. All right, so it's very important. And if you look down the successful entrepreneurs in Japan or the United States, you'll see they started this company largely because they were successful in another company and saw an opportunity. Because you're a good entrepreneur when you know the customers, the suppliers, who's who, the friends, who you can call. And the most likely thing to make you successful as an entrepreneur is the number of addresses you have in your iPhone that you can call for help. So it's really important to understand that programs to encourage the young to start companies are usually wrong because we don't then tell them how to be successful. We just tell them to start a company. At, we're, at our education programs at Stanford and Santa Clara, we tell, them, we, we tell them get experience in the industry you're interested in, come back in 10 years and tell me what you want to do. And a lot of people protest, say, no, I want to be an entrepreneur. And we say, I'm teaching you. Another thing that's really, really important to understand is entrepreneurs and risk. Entrepreneurs don't like risk. They avoid risk. The study after study after study, so entrepreneurs are the most risk-averse people, the people that get rid of it. What's interesting is that good entrepreneurs know they're in a risky environment but they learn how to manage it and minimize the risk. This is exactly like being a pilot in an airplane, and I am a pilot, okay? Being an inexperienced person at the controls of an airplane is a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> it's very safe if you, know the pr if you know what you're doing, and we fly on airplanes all the time. It's an inherently risky environment. You don't want young people flying you from here to Japan. You want person who's had 30,000 hours in high-performance jets flying their airplane. So good entrepreneurs know how to deal with the risk management and they get rid of it. It's also important to understand that if an entrepreneur fails, then it's mostly like out likely outcome next time is to fail again. And if they succeed in the first venture, the most likely outcome is to succeed. It is not, it, we cannot find any evidence that failure generates success. <laughs> Some people do learn from failure, but that's very few. Most people fail. Entrepreneurship and inequality, this is what I want to kind of finish with, and it's kind of the big places we're going to, and I know it's a big topic of discussion. Um, I've already heard three sessions that just address the issue of inequality. Entrepreneurship is becoming an ideology, not a thing that I've looked at 10 policies and this is one of them, but we must do this no matter what, without question. Of the 171 countries in the world, 140 of them, have adopted new policies in the past three years to promote entrepreneurship of one kind or another. So it's very much becoming the where you do. If you, if you, I want economic growth, let's create new companies. What happens is it separates them from rational policy. Small companies to succeed need big companies. One of the greatest insights that I think you'll hear today is that uh, how it's important to get Japanese big companies to buy from small firms. But that is true. You need a balance of good economic policy. You need healthy big companies to get healthy small ones. And what's really worrisome about it is that at these sessions, you're looking at, uh, well, us two. We're successful entrepreneurs, but there are 300 behind us who failed. And we don't invite those to the conferences. We made money off this gig. And so I guess we deserve to be here. But we run the risk of thinking we deserve to be here and that those people don't. And by concentrating money that way, we run the risk of making not only inequality worse, but making acceptable. That is, you're poor because you didn't form a good company. You're rich because you're smart enough to start one. So it's really important that that's what's happening. We have to be careful that we see entrepreneurship as one policy option among many and that it's part of a balanced approach. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed. It's really important to understand that the US and Japan have roughly similar rates of entrepreneurship, but they're different. And that difference is as well, it seems, in what we're going to talk about. So it's really important that we do entrepreneurship, but it's important we understand accurately what it is so we can make the right choices. Thank you. Yes. OK. Uh, my name is Fujio Ishiguro. I'm the president and the CEO of NetEar Group Corporation. Uh, that is providing a uh, uh, digital marketing service mainly to uh, big corporations. And actually, so we start up a company in the United States, 
and uh, transferred the headquarters to Japan in 1999 because of the huge gap of uh, well, internet population and technology. And we think uh, we, we see the opportunity more in Japan and we can be competitive. That's the reason you know, we come to Japan. And then uh, we went to IPO. Well, we had a hard time because you know, 2000, it was a time of the collapse of the bubble that hit our you know, activities. But uh, you know, then it changed a little bit uh, about a business model and the concentrate to uh, you know consulting work that is very very you know it's uh, um, um, very uh, kind of conservative, but uh, you know can make a profit. Then went to IPO two thousand eight, uh, but before that you know so the before we we s I started the uh, Netyal Group. Uh, in the United States, I had a small consulting company concentrate to uh, high tech. You know, after graduating from uh, uh, Stanford MBA, that he mentioned MBA work does not work for a startup, <laughs> but <laughs> I learned a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> yeah. Uh, after that, uh, I set up my small consulting company concentrate to uh, high tech. Uh, mainly uh, helping to transfer the technology <coughs> between Japan and U.S., helping the Yahoo and the Netscape to come to Japanese market and help the to find the new technology for um, Japanese big corporation. So my uh, my argument, just my uh, based on my experience, that's not unique, uh, Bob standpoint, but uh, I, it's not uh, it's not uh, any study, but. It's kind of intuitive sense, you know, that based on my experience, both U.S. and Japan. So, so my argument is, uh, I'm going to point out what's missing in Japan to, you know, accelerate entrepreneurship. You know, this is good because, you know, so if we fill the gap, you know, we can be, you know, better. So first, <coughs> the Lord of VC, or a uh, level of the maturity of VC is different. So in the United States, a lot of successful entrepreneurs become, you know, turn into uh, the uh, venture capitalist later on. So they, you know, they teach us, you know, how to grow. They provide the network of uh, customers and a partnership. So it did really help, or not only putting, putting the money, but also, you know, their capability and ability to a startup. But in Japan, I cannot find uh, not many you know, entrepreneurs become uh, you know, venture capitalist. I'm not uh, talking about the Globus. Globus, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, I'm serious. You know, Globus, one of the very few I respect as a you know, venture capital firm because it's independent and it's really true. You know, most of the venture capital firm uh, in Japan is under, you know, bank and a security brokerage firm. You know, they hire new graduate, they put them to our, you know, board, and a new graduate, how they can teach us? You know, that's very different. And uh, also, you know, <laughs> scheme of VC uh, in the United States, GP as a venture capitalist, putting their own risk money. You know, usually they put 1% of the fund you know, other 99% come from outside, uh, pension or, you know, institution money. But GP, venture capitalists, put their, their risk money to the fund. You know, Japan, you know, there's no, you know, compensation. There's no, you know, return of the investment to GP, you know, without a carrot for horse. How can they work hard? So that's different uh, in terms of VC. And the fund size uh, for the whole venture capital money is very different. Uh, you know, in the United States, um, the size of the venture capital fund is 20 times as much as Japan. So how can we compete? Let's say Google. Google raise. Thank you. <laughs> I hate technology. I really <laughs> <laughs> Let's dance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, 
you know, Google is not a software company. That's my observation. Google is an infrastructure ma uh, company because, you know, if, you know, Japan come up with the same idea as Google, you know, we cannot make a Google because, you know, Google invent a search engine, but what they do is with using a search engine, they make whole internet is an ad network. That's the biggest ad network. You know, in order to support this biggest ad network, you know, we need, you know, millions of server, millions of T1. That's, you know, that's the money we need. You know, Google raised a uh, one billion US dollar before IPO. In Japan, you know, no one cannot raise such money. So that's why we cannot compete with them. So that's very different, you know, between Japan and US. Um, in terms of the term sheet, so have you seen the term sheet in Japan? So um, US, so a lot of so v VC use preferred stock that is um, and different from common stock. You know, preferred stock is sort of protection for the and the shareholder, but at the same time, the preferred stock, ti um, the price of the preferred stock could be 10 times as much. What I mean is founder can stop without their big, you know, their own money. So, well, in Japan, they, you know, they create the law to use sort of preferred stock, but not so many, you know, people use it because in you know, a VC does not, do not understand how to use. So it's changing, you know, some startup now use a preferred stock, but uh, there is very few. And also convertible note, uh, you know, it's uh, getting popular in the United States, but in Japan, you know, almost none. And uh, the worst thing is kaitori joko. I do not translate because I don't find uh, any English term for that. You know, kaitori joko is that, uh, um, you know, investor, you know, VC can get the money back when, you know, company goes wrong. How do you call it? It's called bank, right? But most of VC put this you know, article in the term sheet. It's the most miserable things. Um, I talked about, uh, you know, finance, you know, market. I talk about, uh, you know, general market. Um, I find, you know, co uh, Japanese corporate, you know, buying habit. You know, in the United States, the, you know, startup can grow because big corporation, you know, buy their, you know, product and software and application. Because, you know, you talked about productivity, you know, the staff or, you know, employee of the big corporation always care about their productivity. You know, they, you know because they, their compensation system is sort of a contingent or performance base. You know, they need a new invention to, you know, get the more productivity. But in Japan, no one cares. You know, recently, uh, you know, so some startup go to IPO in the United States. That's, you know, develop the productivity software like a Zendesk or, you know, Box or Evernote. You know, these companies go to IPO, but their so sales stock in the United States is to increase the productivity. But they have had a hard time to come to Japan, penetrate the Japanese market because, you know, they use the same word of the sales stock productivity. You know, no Japanese company care about it. And they, they reacted like, huh, what is the productivity? <laughs> they react only for cost cutting. So this buying habit really, you know, so the, well, Japanese, you know, startup, you know, cannot grow because big corporation do not help, you know, the, in the purchasing. And the labor diversification, you know, of course, you know, so we are very homogeneous. Uh, you know, diversification is the source of invention, so innovation. You know, basically, you know, so there's uh, not so many, you know, female, you know, workforce and immigration. You know, this is, this is, they're also bad things. And the dual income, I said, in the, in the United States, um, okay, you know, husband want to set up. And, uh, and uh, the wife, 
you know, work for a big corporation as an engineer. That helps. You know, the, you know, Japanese, you know, Japanese woman tend to be housewife. You know, the husband has to do by himself. So that we have to change. So flexible labor law, uh, in Japan, we have a hard time to change the organization. You know, in US, there is a, you know, law, you know, common law, so-called at will. At will means, you know, company management can fire people at any time, at any reason. Only one exception is, um, you know, discrimination, that's it. Even the you know, employees' performance is great, you know, company can fire them. You know, I don't want to fire it, but uh, for company, you know, sometimes we need to change the organization dramatically, so that's help you know, the Silicon Valley company can grow. Sure. <laughs> so finally, the, well, in terms of the business model, that's I observed. You know, so my company is a marketing company. Um, when going back to the you know, time, you know, I was in the United States, you know, my small company also doing an investment. You know, I led a lot of business model. And the s all the business model has some essence of marketing and branding. That's Japanese company, Japanese startup do not really care. And also the Japanese, you know, Japanese business model is also you know, always you know, sort of product out. But uh, in the US, people, you know, people always think about the users. You know, I don't know how to call it, user experience design or user you know, oriented, these things. You know, Japanese you know, business model is always missing. So finally, you know, maybe in order to do it, you know, we have to go back to education. You know, educational system in Japan is always toward bias for memory. You know, we always, you know, teacher told us answer, and we don't need answer. We need to come up with, uh, you know, formula by ourselves how to solve the problem. You know, that's probably the fundamental change. Shigo-san, thank you very much. Uh, Shin, I think uh, you have uh, ex a lot of experience helping uh, different entrepreneurs be successful in Japan. So what's your uh, view? Is it changing? Is the situation very positive? Is it changing? What's your view? Yes, I think the situation is quite positive. Um, Ishiguro-san gave us a very good historical big picture overview of how Japanese uh, entrepreneurship and the ecosystem started but uh, I want to take a position that uh, I want to uh, change your stereotype o image of Japan not being entrepreneurial. Actually, Japanese startup ecosystem is started to come into a virtuous cycle. Uh, in the valley, I think it took like seven or eight generations right. to uh, become like the valley, and New York, it took like four generations. Japan is about third or the fourth generation, and the ecosystem is started to uh, get into the virtuous cycle. Um, I want to touch on like four elements, uh, entrepreneurs, mentors, supply of capital, and exits. First of all, in terms of entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, we are now in like third or fourth generation. So a um, lot of entrepreneurs are becoming serial entrepreneurs, or a lot of entrepreneurs are spinning off from what used to be startups, but now which is like $1 billion, $2 billion, huge corporations. So they have experienced that rapid growth or they have seen that uh, best practices. So we are now seeing a lot of um, uh, good quality um, and a lot of entrepreneurs coming out. So for example, our fund, Globus Fund, the latest fund, uh, about 50% of our investments are into serial entrepreneurs. So um, maybe with our set uh, fund, which started out in 90, uh, nine, it was only like 20%. So definitely the quality of entrepreneurs are rising and a number of entrepreneurs are rising too. And the second point uh, necessary for the ecosystem is mentors and a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs uh, are becoming angel investors and you know even without angel investors, in, in angel investing, they're becoming mentors for the younger generation. Uh, like management, and founders of Gree, DNA, Cyber Agent, or uh, Kakakom, or things like that. Those guys are helping the you know the younger generation. 
so that they can follow their footsteps. So I think there's a lot more support for the younger and early stage companies, uh, both in terms of knowledge and money. And as for the risk money, Ish Ishiguro-san mentioned that uh, you know, in Japan, traditionally, a lot of VCs were bank affiliates, thus they weren't really true risk money. But I think the situation is changing gradually. Uh, even the bank affiliated VCs, um, they are changing a little bit and uh, they are starting to take back the uh, buyback clause Ishiguro-san mentioned. You know, it's crazy. You know, if you think of uh, equity investment and have a buyback clause and it's, it's like a loan. So a lot of um, what we call independent VCs like Globus, uh, we um, started to invest in startups like the Silicon Valley way. And, you know, it was a pure equity, pure risk money play. Um, the bank affiliated VCs learned that they can't get into deals by having that kind of um, irrational clauses. So um, they started to change too. And we are seeing more and more independent VCs uh, being started up. Um, you know, as for Globus, you know, we are the first independent VCs and our LPs, investors are global LPs. And our fund performances so far have always been in top global top quarter. So we kind of showed that based on Japanese uh, startup ecosystem, even VCs here can, um, you know, have the same kind of track record equivalent to uh, top tier VCs uh, in the Valley. And as for exits, yes, uh, there's still a lot of room for M&As to happen. But actually, uh, I think Japan is one of the most privileged market here in the world because we have the mother's market, which is um, the small cap market equivalent to NASDAQ. Um, for good and for bad, the um, IPOs tend to be very small. Uh, you can go the medium market cap of going public in mothers is like 80 million US, whereas on NASDAQ, it's like 300 million. So the entrepreneurs and the investors have the luxury of being able to go public very small. That gives the entrepreneurs opportunity for um, accessing the public market for fundraising. And that gives the flexibility to investors for early exits. Um, I say for good and for bad, definitely it's very good to have an option value, but if if the mindset of the entrepreneurs and the investors are like, you know, go for small hits rather than big home run, you know, the companies, um, you know, kind of go public very immature. And sometimes we have like public living dead or mothers. But I think um, because of the ecosystem is being developed, uh, entrepreneurs, quality is rising, quality investors are coming up. I think a lot more um, stakeholders are aiming for big home runs like in the US. So I think um, the all of the ecosystem has just about to start to turn into a very good cycle. And most recently, we have seen a big trend of um, experienced serial entrepreneurs being able to raise like uh, uh, 20 million US dollars in Series B. So I think in terms of um, um, fundraising infrastructure, we are on the same basis as the rest of the world. And the opportunity around, especially around mobile, the market is global and the distribution, which is like the app stores and all that, uh, is global. So uh, I think Japanese uh, startups have the opportunity of being able to uh, regain leadership in mobile ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Panchet, what's, um, when you think back uh, and you've listened to the, all the arguments about the VC and the, the entrepreneurs in, in Japan, how do you compare it to with your view of Southeast Asia and your personal experience? Let me just uh, add into some points that, that after listening on all the uh, nice presentations, I think we all agree that entrepreneur is um, it's very important word. Without this word, uh, the world would not be like today. And in the past, starting from believe it or not, like Christopher Columbus. He's a one of more or less entrepreneur. He negotiated for himself getting a, the ship from the Queen, ex, uh, explore outside, even come to the West, to Asia, and then get whatever he get, he get percentage from, from what he acquires. Bill Gates or Steve Jobs also are great entrepreneurs. Without these people, I think the world would be much poorer because of uh, lack of creation. 
it utilizes and enhances the value creation of all the other things. And of course, an entrepreneur doesn't have to be only technical. It could be also, also non-technical as well. In, in the culture of Asia, like, uh, like Japan too, or in my country, also my, my late grandfather came from China, so Chinese system in Asia is a bit different from perhaps from Europe or from US. Entrepreneur here doesn't have to be a new guy, just graduate and go solo and form an IT company. And of course, some get successful, like Professor Robert say, but a lot may uh, fail. But uh, also, entrepreneur could be um, family to family, generation to generations, success, succession of the, the things. And of course, there are failures. And I, I'm, I might say that there are more failures than successes. But in, in case that we notice that um, uh, this, the family also tend to uh, nurture or incubate the, the offsprings, the, the later generation, um, they also they have a choice now. They can is, uh, choose to work in their own family's company or they can choose to be partner or, or doing uh, professional work that they want. There are two also cases. So entrepreneur at this stage can be just shareholders or shareholders plus management. So this also uh, would may I apply to Japan, in my country very obviously, to my own family and so on. And then um, we have to, to do, uh, there are pros and cons into it. A family member, of course, is very passionate and also obligated to do well to the family business. But it necessarily means he is a capable manager. He or she may not be the best fit. So you may have to f hire in the professionals. Like in the US, many family companies are not run by a family members. They are run by uh, professionals. And um, that also there's a hybrid of it. So a mix of family members and professionals. So in each model, each place, you have to uh, think global and act local for, for this matter. The entrepreneur, of course, create all the things that we have now. But don't forget one thing. You, we all cannot be entrepreneurs in every one of us. We have to work for some company as well. Uh, salary men, uh, professionals, employees also have to be uh, there. So in, in ASEAN, for example, or in general case, we tend to think of 50-50. Half is entrepreneur and half is uh, professional or employed uh, personnel. So the both are um, interdependent. And uh, of course, um, like in the case of Japan, because my family has been partnered with Mitsubishi Motors more than, more than 50 years, so I, I have, a, uh, fortunately, I have learned a lot of uh, uh, big carrots and also uh, the culture that have been changing for the you know, half a century. And we see that now, because Japan also has to adopt to a lot of things, a change. In 1980s, a uh, Japanese car was the cheapest and among uh, US and European comparison. But then the yen appreciated, if you all remember, and then it, it is not the cheapest car in the, in the auto industry anymore. So they have to adjust to uh, overseas production. That's why we have the factory in Mitsubishi in Thailand and other countries. And uh, US uh, cannot import the cars directly from Japan to, to US. I was working with Chrysler in Detroit at that time. Um, um, and then we have to switch to the uh, other sourcings. The, ca the cars produced from Thailand, cars produced from Spain, from Mexico also fit in. You see things are changing. And now I think what uh, I agree with uh, uh, my colleague here, the things that Japan is very, has a cutting edge, it's its own technology and its, its knowledge. And this is so priceless. So I think if you, you think of using this as a tool or export knowledge, so to say, um, I think it's very f uh, formidable and it's quite promising to, to see this. And look at companies like Nike. They never have a factory. They never own a factory. They just give the patent, the design. They hire somebody to do it for them. There's a factory in China. There's a factory in, in Vietnam, in Thailand, or even here. But uh, they go for that. They get paid for building a, a pair of shoes, say, um, at the cost of $10 that Nike pay them. Then after processing, overhead, marketing, advertising, the shoe is priced, what, $200. So they're taking the Shanghai wide without investing anything in, in terms of manufacturing, thus eliminating headache in labors, in 
government laws and so on and so forth. So there are many ways that you can be uh, investing, doing business, and, uh, and the knowledge and innovation of, of this country is also um, very important. And uh, to be able to create the, um, the entrepreneurship of, of any place, I, I still believe that there have to be a good ambience. Uh, incubation model has to be very important. Uh, financial is the first one. We talk about venture fund, putting the money into many IT companies like Cory Sang did. And when the IT got uh, you know, supported by financial, they'd be able to uh, increase their, their research and, and uh, their development of the product, finally. Academic facility is also very important because um, I believe that in, in any country, you must have a good combination of uh, schools, universities, um, the employers, meaning corporation, and the government. They must work as a same system or as a team. It's difficult to do that because these three models also always have different kind of thinking. So academic has one way of thinking. Employers, they want their capable employees to come in uh, their own way. And sometimes universities do not produce exactly the same uh, uh, individuals that they want. But government also have to come in with their uh, law or their supporting uh, legalities or, or facilities. And of course, uh, uh, we, we work as a team like this. We will see the development into a near perfect uh, combination. Um, also, um, that, there's a lot of things which is going on now. Um, some people want to develop it very, very fast. And then um, sometimes you have to take it slow and develop from, from step one, which um, I will uh, you know, elaborate later on second round. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we move to Q&A, let me do another round with a, maybe one question for each of you. Uh, and if you can limit your response to there's a few few minutes, I'm sure we'll have other. Um, Robert, um, there is one point that was mentioned about uh, we talked a little bit before about rigidity of the uh, of of Japan. And uh, there was some people would argue, why don't don't you need a Silicon Valley type environment from a legal and regulatory point of view to be successful? What would you say to that? Yeah, in one minute, um, I can say about 15 minutes, but I'll try to keep it. <laughs> I'll try to keep it to one. It's very important to understand that flexibility is, we're talking about, when people talk flexibility, they're talking about regulations. Regulations are usually put there for a reason. I'm not gonna advocate for regulations, but one of the reasons it's hard to fire people is you don't wanna be maybe like Silicon Valley, where we have hordes of 50-year-olds wandering basically the streets, that's a metaphor, that don't have jobs, but they take consulting jobs one, one by one. And maybe the government does have a valid interest in keeping people employed. We have to consider that. The second thing that is very, very important is that we know from studies of regulations in various places in the world that the most highly regulated places, Silicon Valley, for example, San Francisco, and there are the places where there's the most entrepreneurship. It's not that high regulations cause it, but they don't seem to hurt it. What businesses need is a knowledge of their environment. So if they know what the rules are, and, they, uh, and it doesn't change a lot, then they can manage it. It was harder with my company to fire somebody here than it was in the United States, but probably not as hard as it is in France. You know, what's the, <laughs> right. <laughs> so what's the right thing to do? Again, we need to think about it carefully, but consistency is probably more important than ease. Ishiguro-san. You, uh, we talked uh, quite a bit about um, you know Japan and Japan-specific issues. How how much do you think Japanese company or Japanese-originated entrepreneurial companies can be successful on the global stage? You mean the startup or big uh, startups. corporations? Startups. Yeah, startups. How can we be successful? Is there some limitations? The fact of being very Japanese, is there a limit to their success globally? Well, again, the, you know, so going back to the issue of uh, fund size, you know, to be global, uh, so, so you mentioned, you know, so the, and maybe, you know, so the, you know, Apple, you know, Apple store, you know, Jesus stuff uh, can be global without uh, big money. I, you know, so I agree with that. But uh, my point is, you know, so our industry, you know, uh, the things are platformer. Platformer is like you know, Google and Apple and Amazon. You know, these company, you know, raise a big fan even after IPO. You know, we can be a, you know, application developer, 
and we can have uh, you know small success, but we cannot compete with these platformer. You know that's my point. So you need more, more funds and more uh, well, money. You know, so we need Bigger. a lot of things. Yeah. But uh, you know, so things are yeah. good because you know, so once Japanese Japanese yeah. you know so the you know, personality or you know our capability is pretty good. Once we set the goal, you know we can go first. But a goal has not set. You now we understand what to do. Yeah. So, so Shin. What do you think? Do you think uh, venture capitals and banks in Japan are ready to support? Is Globis going to be big enough to actually create the next Google, the one billion, <laughs> one billion funding? Uh, yes. We uh, all hope yeah, so. Uh, at, at least in uh, early stages. Um, I think um, the the concept of being global is uh, you know kind of like a myth. You know, um, I think a company could come from Japan or the U.S. and then it could become global and the fundraising and all the others are just the house of becoming global. So if a Japanese company is very successful in Japanese domestic market, and uh, up till now we were siloed down into domestic market because the market was kind of big enough to become complacent. But um, because of you know the glo market and the channel becoming global is both opportunity and threat, a lot of Japanese companies are looking at the global market. But I think... Uh, the fundamental challenge there is um, even including the big corporate Japans, um, Japanese um, business um, ecosystem lacks the experience of global business and management. So I think if there's a really savvy entrepreneur who is capable of doing business globally and who can fundraise from like, you know, Goldman Sachs in New York or something, fundraising doesn't become an issue. But still, if he c comes from Japan, Japanese own ecosystem can uh, sustain his seed round or early stage. So I think um, the issue is thinking globally from day one and having the management talent to pull it out. Achara, what, um, is it easier to be successful in Thailand or in Fr or Japan? Are you more globalized in Thailand? Well, I think Japanese companies are very much global already. Uh, maybe we just don't know it by ourselves, but uh, it is. And having manufacturing base globally, having uh, uh, set up a network of both sales and distribution, research and development, and the manufacturing satellites, um, it's it's quite quite strong compared to uh, up and coming new new nations or new economies. I'm talking about economy or or, or country as a whole. So. So uh, that that can be used as a, a great a great springboard if you like to create something. But when you have in good innovation, you must find place to market it or to nurture it or, or expand it. Uh, Sometimes things that happen in a laboratory cannot get it be being brought out and make it uh, you know billions of dollars because of the chance of losing the connectivity. I think you are blessed with this already, and uh, I believe that the matters in like when we do economics that when we after the growth then we have to make it uh, growth then stability sustainability and uh, fairness the, the the stability is also very important because uh, sometimes easy come easy go you just come in and then the, you cannot just find a follow-up product or services Susten sustainability is also very important because we live in a world with the a gdp concern but has to be a good gdp uh, one thing that it is excluded from GDP is the um, environmental or, uh, or, or the um, degradation, which is like when you co create pollution, is, th is there a measure in the GDP at all? So these things also have to be pursued, and of course, the world is not fair or equal, but, but uh, you have to be the best of it. So you're very optimistic. Quite. Yeah. Quite so, so let me, um, um, maybe we'll turn it to Q&A. One, one thing I take away at this moment is that uh, uh, which is, uh, is, is there is a lot of optimism about entrepreneurship in, in Japan. What you know, you all say it's actually very vibrant. There is a, uh, there is possibly there are, you know, there are people who have the global global mindset. But there is a context that needs to be improved if we want to do even more. You know, it may be size of the funds, it may be education, it may be, but it is a very strong starting base. And that that uh, to me is a counterintuitive insight to most people, I would think. So on that, uh, maybe I can turn it to the to the floor and please ask questions. Please take your name and um, and maybe ask um, tell us who you want to direct the question oh, to. Hello, 
Hi, I'm Cynthia Phillips. I'm here with the Plastic Oceans Foundation, and um, I live in Woodside, right near you. And um, I wanted to ask, actually, each of you to comment on this. In Brazil, in Chile, they have huge funds, Startup Brazil, Startup Chile, that's doing great work with entrepreneurs. And I was just wondering your perspectives on those kind of funds and the effectiveness, and also how does that affect potentially social entrepreneurship on key issues? Sure. Um, I'm associated with Startup Chile, so, you know. Uh, Startup Chile is interesting. It gives them the equivalent of 200,000 U.S. dollars, uh, people to start companies. Um, I, I'll be very, very direct about this. The, we really don't know that they work, um, and the jury is still out, is probably the right thing to say. If you think of all your famous American companies that we all admire, not one of them came out of an incubator. None of them came from et cetera. And what's distinct about Silicon Valley is the absence of government. There is no support for companies. We, we, we hate that. But there is, you know, there is, we, we have an absence of government support. So it's surprising to us. I like Silicon Valley, so we need government help. Never can really figure that out. But what's interesting about it, uh, 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 about it is that maybe these social things, and it goes right to that, and we've talked about this at Startup Chile and other places, because they are government supported, they don't have quite the strong the profit imperative or growth imperative, and they can take time to do more social uh, activities. So that may be a place to breed social entrepreneurship. We don't know, but the jury's still out. We hope so. Ishiguro-san, you don't seem to disagree fundamentally. But would you support government funding for entrepreneurs? It's a very difficult question uh, because, you know, so basically I do not believe, you know, government can support or even for, you know, they create the big fund, you know, who can manage that? Uh, you know, government is a government. I think government law is to, you know, get rid of the, you know, the some, you know, bad, you know, so the legal things. That I think is a basic government law, but uh, um, better than nothing. I just, <laughs> let me just add one more thing because government support was critical in Silicon Valley's history, and it really is important to understand this. And it's not that the government went and supported companies, it created a market. The government purchased semiconductors for the purpose of building rockets. Nobody knew how to do it. We were trying to build rockets that could launch things to the moon or other countries. And every pound on top of that thing took a lot of power at the bottom of it. And so the government put out contracts and said, please develop later computers. And so the government can support it by creating a market for technology, not by supporting companies. Right. I agree th with that. But, uh, you know, so I remember, you know, government created a big fund for IT fund, you know, several years ago. And what they did was, you know, ask a big corporation to buy IBM server. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the, the French did the same thing with IT systems, so not sure that the, fund, the government is always the best investor. Um, yeah, uh, Daniel Auerbach, Fidelity Ventures. Um, I want to just camp on to Cynthia's question. Shin, maybe you can talk a little bit about INCJ in that context. Um, I think that's a perfect example of government backing startups in Japan. Uh, and in particular, I think the question is around, uh, can they be a catalyst, uh, but how do they sort of uh, divorce themselves from government policy and provide pricing discipline in making investments? Uh, that's the first question. That's a politically difficult, difficult question to answer, but uh, <laughs> try to be I, I saw correct. a sign out here that said this was a secret session, so yeah, I think we okay. should be okay. <laughs> so yes, um, INCJ is a Japanese government fund, basically flowing uh, like billions of uh, US dollar into Japanese startup ecosystem. Um, I think they have done good and bad for the uh, ecosystem. Um, basically, the most recent situation, like half a year or so, uh, a lot of government money has flown into the Japanese uh, ecosystem. Thus, um, a lot of startup has been able to raise like tens of millions of US dollars at, like in the valley. Um, yes, the companies with fundamentals, they've been able to do that. Some companies, from my very kind of objective view, without fundamentals has also been able to do that too. 
So um, some people worry. Some people say it's a bubble here uh, because you know suddenly the inflow of capital has become like five times, ten times, and um, so I in a very short term micro view, uh, it kind of created the um, bubble-like situation. But from the long term perspective, it definitely uh, got rid of the bottleneck of. Um, supply of capital Ishiguro-san was talking about earlier on. So if the money flows into the right uh, sectors and right um, companies, I think government can be very functional in um, helping the ecosystem. But I think the government has to make the right investment decisions. Um, I think I'm also a kind of like a market believer. Um, I think the government money should flow into the sectors where o not only the economics uh, uh, is the reason, maybe like universal service kind of thing, or uh, where the, the private market dynamics are dysfunctional. So I don't think um, the government money um, works very well in the sectors where the private money is already there. Very good. Questions? Please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Greg Story from Dale Carnegie Training. One of the things often said about Japan and funding innovation like this is the fear of failure, the shame of failure, and culturally in Japan the reluctance to fail and have that shame. Are there any other examples of other cultures around the world where you've got a similar fear of failure, shame of failure, but they've discovered some ways of getting around that and actually then seed innovation? Or is this just a uh, cultural bottleneck for Japan and it's never going to change because the culture is not going to change in a big hurry? Robert. We've actually studied this, um, so thank you. Um, failure fair is interesting. Number one, if you start a company without a failure failure, I wouldn't put a dime in you. Okay, so you better be scared of failure if you start a company for you know, using my cash. Um, that's first. <laughs> Second of all, it's very, very local, the effect. Um, in the United States, for example, we don't love failure. We don't all want to be entrepreneurs. My mother in Jackson, Michigan, still despises me for starting a company in Japan and still wonders why I couldn't have gotten a real job. They're very risk averse in Kansas City. Cleveland's not so dynamic. Sorry if anybody's from Cleveland. <laughs> um, I like Cleveland, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Japan's the same way. Among older generation, the people who suffered and had to be very careful of what they bought and very careful how they conduct their affairs, you see a lot of conservatism. You do among my parents who suffered from the Depression in the United States. Um, among younger generation, it's different, and so we see different parts of Japan. So in Japan's entrepreneurial community, the people that start companies, the serial entrepreneurs, you fund, we, I was a part of that group. We all like, you know, we'll take risks left and right, take some money, you know, everything else. And so it's what's really kind of interesting about Japan, and I'll kind of real quick, is that Japan develops very good companies. She talked about the efficiency of capital investment. You can think of on your hands, Rock 10, BNA, um, uh, what, GRI, uh, you know, and these are big global companies. I can't d count many more American companies, you know, who are less than 20 years old. So it's really important to understand that failure is healthy. It Fear of failure is healthy. It ought to be careful. If it gets to become a barrier, it's regional and probably due not to culture, but more to recent history. It tends to change over generations. Shin, you want to add? Yeah, I, I think even in Japan, the social stigma thing was relative to being in a big corporation in a growing economy. So I think in our parents' generation, it was good to be with a family type of big corporation. If you joined a big corporation, you were automatically successful, you know kind of moving up the ranks together with the economy. But nowadays, gen what we call Generation 76 and below, the Generation 76 is the, I'm actually Generation 76, we experienced the dot-com bubble during university, and we, you know, a lot of our generation took risks because I think we now realize that even being with the big corporations, there's a lot of risks associated, you know, uh, Nissan, Olympus, Sharp, you can name, you know, Sony, you know, any kind of you know brand, good brand Japanese corporations getting into bad situations. So now our younger generation 
realize that, you know, as Robert mentioned, it's a social and acceptance thing. Uh, you know, there's risk being associated with be doing anything. So why don't you do whatever you like and self-actualize? That's the kind of mindset we have. I actually choose to add on this. I, I agree with that. I think there is two parts to this uh, stigma, if you want. One is the penalties in Japan were very severe, as you said about the clawback. So, you know, you you were... You the more your penalties are severe, the more you'll be very, it's not just shame, it's bank, you know, you're bankrupt and no job forever. So as soon as this goes away, I think you'll see a lot of more people be different. And I, we do a lot of recruiting uh, in college in, in, in Japan. So I meet a lot of uh, uh, young students and it's exactly what you said, Shin. I think the, there is a difference in saying, well, you know, I look at my parents and maybe that's not exactly what I think is a sure, the safety may not be as safe as we think, and on the other hand, doing something else is very different. And so I think there is a shift, at least from our point of view, of, of people who are more ready to take risks. Not the majority, but you don't need 100% of the population to do this. You <coughs> need a few. Actually, if I can just support you real quickly, when Japan yeah. relaxed its its uh, bankruptcy laws in 2003, there was a burst of entrepreneurship here, and above older and better educated people. And so what you saw is people who saying, you know, I've got a great job. They weren't going to jump when bankruptcy law was severe, but when very little light, we really got it. It was a big effect. Um, questions? I think is there good? Oh, I can bring in. That will go. Thank you for the presentation. I'm going to win. I'm a full-time student uh, at Globus University. And uh, uh, sorry, Ms. Uh, Ishiguro, uh, in your presentation, I saw that you mentioned about labor diversification. Could you ex please explain more about labor diversification? To what extent it would affect uh, entrepreneurship in Japan? Because we all know that Japan is facing like a population shrinking problem, right? Um, is there any chance for us, like we are uh, foreign foreigners, to, to, to start a business in Japan? Um, I was talking about a diversification because, you know, so, so for the innovation, there is a common sense uh, to be innovative, you know, diversification and the communication between, you know, any races and genders are very necessary. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, so the Silicon Valley company you know, put the, you know, so the labor's layout, you know, intentionally, you know, as a department, you know, so sit next to, you know, next, 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 that. So, you know, <laughs> these things, you know, so are very necessary, you know, to, you know, company grow. That's why, you know, so I just put on a diversification. But also, I'm a member of a committee of uh, so-called future, um, uh, Japan, uh, future to choose. Uh, organized by a cabinet uh, department. Um, um, the, the discussion is, you know, Japan's population in 50 years, you know, it become uh, 80 million. You know, it's two thirds of this population. Japan's economy is shrinking, you know, very, very high risk. You know, in order to, you know, solve the problem, you know, we need, you know, female, you know, come back to the labor market as well as the immigration. You know, that's very necessary. And uh, there is, I think, I think, a big chance, you know, foreigner, you know, come to, you know, Japanese market and uh, you have a good big chance, I guess. Let me add a little bit. Yeah. I think for the labor is a global issue now. And I, I think, um, well, uh, like uh, when you say about discrimination, I think nationality is maybe one of the factors there. And uh, here we are all speaking in English, so we see all the words, um, including Japan, getting more internationalized. So uh, having said that, uh, um, not only for labor transfer, but for uh, investment fund but that comes in, it doesn't have to be necessarily limited to the domestic uh, venture funds. There are uh, groups and investment companies outside which are willing to uh, invest into Japan and vice versa. Um, a few years ago, when I was in my government duty, um, we had agreement between the Tokyo Stock Exchange and Thailand Stock Exchange uh, for the second board, the AIM and MAI, same thing, market uh, for alternative investment. The second board, at that time, Mr. Muraki was the MD, so we signed a contract. We list uh, seven or eight companies from Thailand into the second board in Japan. Thus, 
creating the funds transfer and investment from here to there. And later on, some Thai companies come in and invest into uh, uh, some auto parts company. One of them for sure is Okiwara company was uh, acquired. So things like this are also another means of raising fund. And of course, uh, the labors, um, I, 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 that's why we, we talk about government, uh, government cooperation or interference. It's very important because you need the lawmakers to do something. Otherwise, things cannot be done on a corporate level only. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would just to add on that, uh, you know, it's, I lived in China for, for many years. And, uh, and I've seen many, many friends who've had entrepreneurs in China. Most of them have had a very hard time. I've been much le long, less longer in Japan, and I see many of foreigners who've been quite successful in Japan. So I think the, the condition, the rule of law, the rule is actually quite positive. Please. Hi. Uh, uh, my name is Giles Murray. Um, I have a question which is really to everybody and nobody in particular. Um, I think one thing that's striking recently, uh, w you were talking about the big, big companies like Amazon, Google, and so on. And obviously, the Japanese equivalents to that, as you said, are firms like Rakuten and SoftBank. And recently, we're seeing uh, firms like that behaving in a much more global manner. I mean, for example, um, Masayoshi Son managed to get on Charlie Rose to lobby for his unsuccessful taker of, takeover of T-Mobile, which is pretty revolutionary, I think, for a Japanese guy to speak English well on a good, reputable show. Um, and then we're having Rakuten, which is kind of, mm, well, depending how you look at it, kind of wildly buying up second-rate assets all around the world or, or, or being very methodical. And um, I just wondered if, I mean, we've talked a lot about the sort of challenges at the, the, the beginning stage, but obviously there are challenges at the stage of going from being very big to being absolutely fucking enormous. And so I just wondered if you think these clearly entrepreneurial Japanese firms like SoftBank, Rakuten, are ready for that challenge where almost what they do becomes political and they have to become also much more dependent on the expertise of investment banks and so on. Anybody wants to comment? I, I can comment as well. But. I can start because, uh, you know, we, as McKinsey, we work with largely large corporations. And so whether they are new or not, doesn't matter. Uh, I think what you're seeing is, it's not just the, the um, I think what, and I'm encouraged, um, uh, it's not just the, um, the, uh, the, the venture firms or the, most suc the, the recent successful, but everybody in Japan is actually going global. I think there is a understanding, at least that I've seen, uh, that... Uh, in order to compete, in order to be a first nation, Japanese companies have to be participate to the global nature. Now, there are challenges in finding enough talent that have the global mindset to do this. That's very clear. But I would say, you know, if you look at uh, whether it's, uh, you know, MUFG, SMBC, uh, whether it's the failed, sometimes failed bid um, of... Um, um, of MHI or others, uh, they are, it's, it's more of a general trend. Now, is this a challenge? Yes, uh, because I think there is a challenge on the global expertise and the global mindsets. But by and large, I think um, there are enough executives, there are enough people around that you could say they have a, 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 really, fighting, a really fighting chance. And I don't think that's a difference between them being entrepreneurship-led or whether it's a large corporation. I think it's more the mindset of going abroad. I see Shin violently agreeing, so maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah, I, I completely agree on George's comment right now. Um, I think it's about the mindset of the Japanese business community as a whole. And I think um, one is the global management kind of mindset, more on the business and like organization side. And another is understanding the capitalism kind of financial protocol. And I think Rakuten and SoftBank was brave enough to challenge the Japanese old legacy of, you know, not acquiring or not using leverage or, you know. So basically up till now, Japanese, even the big corporations were fighting with one hand when, the, you know, global arena, you were using the business side and the finance side uh, to compete. So I think, you know, um, you said Rakuten was buying second class assets. I think you can 
take it that way or you can say that they um, use that as a huge kind of like a, a signal to show that they are willing to partic participate in the global M&A arena, bring the best deals to Rakuten and they would buy it exp uh, at a higher price. So then the good deal might flow in. And Miki Tani-san definitely has commitment towards it. He has bought his house in the valley. He throws many parties at weekends to get connected into the valley. To add something, and then I probably will take yeah, another actually one. Actually, so I don't know, you know, really detail for that, but uh, you know, I argue that uh, so Google, you know, raised you know one billion before IPO, but the one company that's the uh, EXS, you know, EXS uh, or eMobile, the Samsung, you know, led, you know, so they raised the fund, same size of fund, but uh, they actually, you know, so sort of, you know, the at the beginning of the stage, they access to Goldman. You know, not to uh, you know the Japanese venture capital firm. So I think that to be uh, you know so the you know already big size of I say startup you know has to you know set up the some international organization or access to uh, you know more you know American type of you know things you know so the you know the stage has to be changed to more international you know compose the more you know partnership with uh, you know U.S. and European company. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you you had a question for quite a while. Um, I would like to ask. Uh, Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my, my name is Genri Goto from Kenko.com e-commerce company. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Robert that uh, the difference of the regulatory issue by the government between U.S. and Japan, um, because the uh, in Japan uh, for a company. Um, the government is a big obstacle for our business. They banned some of our business, and we sued the government. And um, in the United States, uh, it seems that, that uh, the, if the Google car uh, launched to the Silicon Valley, um, yeah, if they invent the auto drive car, uh, the Californian state uh, admit the, permit the driving of the auto driving car. But in Japan, if the if some uh, some venture venture com company invents some auto driving car in Tokyo, um, it seems that uh, the government do not allow the that kind of thing. So the market is created by the government, by the regulatory or in United States. Uh, let, okay, let me start with the auto car, and then I'll go to the more general question of regulation of new companies. Okay, so the auto car in the United States is not going easily by any means at all. So let's just straighten that out. The big problem is liability. Suppose two auto cars, auto cars crash into each other. Who are we going to sue? And who's going to pay it? Google doesn't want to be sued. Um, you know, so that's and that's going to take decades to work out. So I don't think you know the American system is showing its ugly teeth there. If you want, and you know maybe something else, but that's really clear. Um, New new technologies are hard to do, hard to put in place. Let's talk about regulation of companies. It's really important to understand that where regulations are consistent and a sane rule of law, we tend to find no real effects on entrepreneurship. It costs about a thousand dollars and takes two weeks to start a company in Cal California. It costs about a thousand dollars and takes about two weeks to start a company in Japan. It's really the same. And there's a government interest in making sure that they're done. The second thing is very important. Most of the law that businesses deal with, very little of them are dealing with what kinds of products they can sell or prices they can charge. Most of the law a new company deals with is common law. How can I get sued? Who's going to take me to court for firing somebody? What's my liability if I do something? And so it is the consistency of the court system and the application of the law and the legal structure that turns out to be most important. This idea that we just need to cut regulations is absolute, almost absolutely false. Um, it's not, it, but the legal system is critical. Can I, I think we are coming to the close. Can I ask each of you for responding to one question, which is, are you an optimist for entrepreneurship in Japan? And if there was one thing to, to do to further, further it, what would you recommend? One after the other? 
I'm an optimist, and if I had to do one thing, it would be have effective child care so women could be entrepreneurs. Shigure-san. He took my word. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We got two. Okay, I'm uh, proactively optimist, and I think what's control controllable from uh, controllable from my position is that uh, having the guts to take risks with the entrepreneur and growing the company's big. It's okay. it's bound to happen, and I I think if we are still invited next year, why don't we find out together uh, if this thing has been progressed to the satisfaction we are expecting. So a very optimistic panel. I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. It was, for me, at least counterintuitive that we would be so optimistic about current situation and the future. And a big thank you to all of you for, uh, for being here today. Thank you very much, Mr. DeVore. Uh, once again, please give a big applause to our panelists.